Dr. David Lukoff is a professor of psychology and a licensed psychologist for the past 40 years. Since the 1980s, he's been educating mental health care professionals about spiritual crises that may present as psychotic disorders. This video tells the story of his own spiritual crisis. In my early 20s, I had a uh, LSD-induced kind of psychotic episode. So that would be the perspective, that label that I have now. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and professor of psychology and teach things like psychopathology. Um, but it also was my spiritual awakening and it also led me professionally to try to contribute to being able to differentiate a uh, psychotic episode from a spiritual crisis that has the potential to be positively transformative if it's allowed to unfold. So my personal experience was uh, that I was in graduate school at Harvard studying anthropology and uh, was 23 years old, uh, actually 22, and uh, on uh, my way to getting a doctorate and uh, had what I would consider to be an existential crisis at the time of really questioning why I was doing this. I had lived a very sheltered life, uh, suburban uh, lifestyle. Uh, my father was actually a professor. And I, my mother's father was a professor, so I'm actually a third generation now in academia. But at that point in my life, I started to really question whether I had been programmed, basically, to carry on this tradition. Uh, and that uh, I think it was absolutely objectively true that I was a very naive, person at that point in my life. Very little questioning of anything, uh, openness to new things, uh, very unconnected with my body. I would smoke cigarettes, was overweight, didn't exercise at all. And uh, there was a part of me that just realized that uh, I didn't know who I was and why I was doing what I was doing. And very precipitously, right after I got my master's degree, I dropped out. Didn't continue on with dissertation committee, blah, blah, blah and uh, got rid of everything I owned that wouldn't fit into a backpack. And I, I had so, other, so few other like, avenues of exploration in my life that it just seemed like doing the opposite of what I was doing, you know, stopping doing all that and just going on the road and starting to hitchhike around the country. It just seemed like the only thing that I could do that was different from what I was doing. So it was pretty radical. Fortunately for me, it was this was 1971, so it still had a lot of the 60s culture to it. I would get picked up by lots of people with long hair and in vans and, uh, and backs of trucks and pickups and stuff like that. And one on my uh, kind of personal journey, which actually included my first uh, backpacking experience. I had bought a backpack and along with it this book, uh, Colin Fletcher, The Complete Walker, this first book that popularized backpacking, bought what else I needed, and uh, in uh, Yellowstone National Park went off for four days. I, I think this journey was, you know, the Cat Stevens song, On the Road to Find Out. That was like my mantra. So I was doing all these things that I knew I had never done, uh, that I wanted to try, you know, uh, and so on. And yeah, being out in nature was definitely one of them. It you know, has that vision quest element, you know, it's just you and nature. Even though we have things like tents and so on, you're in a pretty raw, vulnerable condition if you're used to just, you know, apartments and dorm rooms and stuff like that, that had been my life. So it was part of this journey was, you know, just going to places I'd never been. San Francisco is one of them. And while I was in San Francisco, just walking around Golden Gate Park, somebody offered me a tab of LSD. And I had never done a psychedelic. But again, I was on the road to find out and wanted to try new things. And so the next morning, I took it in Golden Gate Park. And, um, you know, I had this botific experience of just walking around and really feeling the trees breathing. And, you know, I, I was a pretty, uh, I'd been raised in a secular Jewish household. We were never members of a temple. Uh, there really wasn't any kind of overt even spiritual openness. My father 
would have easily said he was an atheist. And basically, if I had been asked at that point in my life, I would have said that too. But, you know, I had this, you know, kind of riveting experience of then going to the ocean and just having thoughts like I'd never had before in my life about, you know, just being really connected, you know, the rhythm of the waves and stuff. I was able to just totally really feel that rhythm in my own body and the inner and the outer kind of breaking down a little bit and, and some of that. So I, I, I really, you know, at the end of the day thought, well, that's uh, wonderful. I wouldn't mind doing that again sometime. But it didn't feel like it had changed my life or anything. Um, and the only really change I noticed from that was the next day when I started to read, I had been carrying around three books in my backpack, and one by Alan Watts was something about, I think, enlightenment. And it had always kind of read like word salad to me as when I tried to read it. And all of a sudden, it made perfect sense to me. And I started to really get interested in some of these concepts of enlightenment and not being as socially programmed, that we are socially programmed, but how do you, are you able to step outside of it at times? And, you know, so it set off a little bit of questioning around that. Uh, what happened was then four days later, I woke up in the middle of the night, just, I was crashing at a place, I think I was in Palo Alto then. Um, and when I looked in the mirror on my way into the bathroom, into the, near the toilet, I was holding my hand up in a position like this. And, uh, now I call it a mudra, I had never heard of the term mudra. Uh, it was giving off a, a, a white light, it was glowing. And as I looked in the mirror and saw my hand glowing, you know, it immediately flashed into my mind that I'm a reincarnation of Buddha. And then I had this second instantaneous insight that I was also the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And that I had been uh, reincarnated in this third form to bring the peoples of the world together. That, and this sounds so naive now when I say it, but you know, Buddha had created a religion of the East and Christ had created a religion for the West that I was going to bring these together. <laughs> and I then set out to write a new holy book. And I spent like five days hardly sleeping, hardly eating, writing this holy book. I have kept a copy and you know, now when I look at it, it's a very 60s hippie-ish vision of people living in communes and having uh, very much a community focus and so on, which was, you know, a, a model for many of the communes and uh, of the 60s. And there are many people who basically had a similar vision to mine that they have articulated very, very uh, lucidly. But anyway, I was all caught up in it and then really had copies of this book printed and uh, distributed it on the, in the streets, just was, went out and handed it out and sent it to friends and relatives and so on. I had a, a network of friends and for about two months I didn't, all I did was crash with them. Sleep in their living rooms or sofas or you know whatever on the rugs. And I, I felt like I had done my work. I had written this book and I seeded the world with it and now all I needed to do was be to wait for the critical mass of people to read this book and, uh, and then this movement would start. So that was my opus, modus operandi for this. So I didn't have to proselytize, I didn't like talk about this. I had actually pretty stimulating conversations uh, with my friends around things that I was in, you know, uh, reading now that I distributed the book. I started to read things by Jung and Joseph Campbell and so on, uh, and found interesting parallels and had all these conversations with people about it. Because they were interested, I think like me, a lot of my friends had not been very spiritually uh, inquisitive and so here I was kind of in that world. And as I read Joseph Campbell and Jung, I also realized that my vision was not so unique, that it didn't make me a special person. So there was a point where uh, I became uh, kind of very embarrassed about this whole incident of 
writing and distributing a book. I decided I needed to kind of uh, understand that experience better. And I still had thoughts, though, that actually I'd come across, in a way, it was, uh, genuine insights, many of which have really influenced how I live my life currently, uh, for example, in a co-housing community. Um, but um, it was also clear to me that this whole vision wasn't going to happen. So my parents at the time owned a uh, summer cottage in Cape Cod. And I asked if I could go live there. Um, and this would have been early March at that point. Um, and they said, sure. And they actually agreed to give me what I said I needed, which was just enough to buy food, which was about 50 bucks a month. And they agreed to that. So I moved there, lived a very simple life, you know, Nothing, no contact with media, phones. Uh, it was just pretty much getting up, uh, going to the library. The library got me any books that I wanted, including other books by Jung and Joseph Campbell. Uh, but also I started to explore uh, other readings like Thomas, or is it Richard Buck, who developed the concept of cosmic consciousness. So all again, I found another parallel to my own experience. And in fact, for many years, that's what I basically considered it, an experience of cosmic consciousness, which is a non-pathologizing term. It both gave it credit for being a powerful, transformative experience, uh, but it also made it clear to me that it wasn't unique, that you know, he listed, I think it was 40 people in that book, and part of his, the reason he wrote the book was to say more and more people are having these kinds of experiences. So um, while I was living by myself, uh, I did some really, uh, you know, I started to, again, connect to nature in different ways because I was much more into the rhythms of uh, the sunset and uh, I could have lights and read at night and stuff like that. But, you know, I started to time a lot of things for, because it was March and pretty nippy, you know, I wanted to be outside in the afternoon when it would be somewhat warm and I would take long walks every day. Um, but, uh, you know, I was also really uh, in some ways becoming confronted with uh, uh, what I had experienced on do lots of different levels and one of which was I became increasingly, as I said, mentioned earlier, embarrassed about aspects of it. And I also started to question, you know, should I have dropped out of Harvard? Could I have, you know, explored things in other ways? You know, was I crazy, you know, for having such bizarre experiences and so on? Uh, my parents had certainly mentioned visiting a psychiatrist, uh, but I was, never felt like they were going to drag me off to a psychiatric hospital or anything, which has happened to other people who've had these similar kinds of experiences. But I did become increasingly depressed and had trouble sleeping and even had these experiences at night while I had insomnia of uh, these figures, masks, faces, even uh, a skeleton kind of hovering above me at night. And the skeleton I actually took to be my own skeleton. At a certain point I also had a recurrence of my, uh, the illness that I recently had surgery for, Crohn's disease. And I had internal bleeding and cramping. And I went to a free clinic. I hitchhiked to a free clinic in Provincetown. And uh, they gave me basically pain medication. I remember at night when I was having some of these kinds of visions, you know, and seeing my own skeleton, you know, contemplating taking all of the pain meds and just being in a state of deep peace. That's how I viewed death. You know, like this would be a state of really deep peace in the, amidst all this turmoil that I was experiencing. I continued, despite these depressogenic ways of thinking, doing walks every day. And on one of my walks along the beach, all of a sudden I heard a voice. I turned around actually thinking there was a voice, a person speaking then. Uh, and there's absolutely nobody there. It was a totally empty beach. But the voice I heard uh, said, become a healer. 
So that started this whole new chain of uh, thinking, you know, what does it mean to become a healer? I mean, this is like 1972 now. Uh, you know, I had studied anthropology at Harvard, so my image of a healer was some indigenous person, perhaps in a, you know, straw skirt, dancing around with rattles or a drum or something like that. So what the hell did that mean? But of course, there's the, you know, 20th century version of the physician. So, you know, did that suggest going to medical school? So I started to think about that, then I started to think about alternative ways of healing, and I started to realize there's a whole world of healers, and that, you know, living in this little cabin at this point, after, for about four months, uh, I would never be able to really learn about those other modes of healing. So again, I contacted my parents who lived in New Jersey, uh, not too far from Manhattan, uh, and asked if I could come and stay at home. And, uh, you know, nowadays that's not unusual for a 20-something to go back home, but it kind of was in those days. They funded my taking a bunch of courses at the Open Center in New York City, which is kind of a human potential center. So I took yoga for the first time in my life. Uh, I took a class on herbs that may have been at a different place. I took a uh, couple of different kinds of encounter type groups. And, uh, and it was really these encounter groups where people would really talk very openly about their reactions to other people, about what was going on in their life. Uh, sexuality, you know, talking very openly about sexual attraction and stuff like that. And I realized, wow, there's a whole world of emotion that I didn't understand either. <laughs> uh, I found a program, I think it was about a six month long training program in these human potential systems, uh, that at the end of which you were kind of given a certificate as a social therapist, meaning you were qualified to lead groups um, at hospitals or outpatient centers or a lot of people did it freelance uh, at schools or drop-in groups and so on. And then I spent the next three years of my life doing that kind of work as a small group facilitator and uh, really liked that and found I was learning a lot about myself and started to be able to see that, well, yeah, that's what become a healer means for me. Um, and uh, applied to graduate school and got accepted in a doctoral clinical psychology program at Loyola University of Chicago and enrolled in that. And it was really there for the first time <laughs> that I learned that what I had experienced would have been diagnosed as a DSM-2 at the time, uh, acute schizophrenic disorder. So the message I got out of that, which I think for that day and age was pretty accurate, was to not talk about this. I better not share that I had had an experience like this. And it's interesting because I actually teach psychopathology now, and now there's a much more openness. People will openly talk in a class uh, about their own personal depression or substance abuse issue or whatever. And so it's nice to see the psychology is more inclusive that way. Uh, than it would have been back than it was back then, really. Fortunately for me, you know, I even though I kind of buried it at that point, that became like, you know, something not to talk about. When I started my clinical psychology internship, I had a supervisor, and at one point I mentioned to the supervisor that I had had a dream about the patient whose tests we were going over, and she kind of looked at me, pushed all the test results aside and said, well, tell me about your dream. So that was the first time I ever shared or really explored with a, working with a dream. And it was, at the time, you know, focused on this patient. But at the end of my rotation with her, I asked her if she would take me on as a low-fee Jungian analytic client. And she did. She agreed to. And I saw her for five years. And that was the first time I really got to explore this experience in a more open way. She actually, at one point, Oh, well, I could share a dream if it seems fitting. Uh, yeah, I had a dream where I was uh, driving in a little red sports car. Uh, no, in a little sports car. And I came to an intersection. And blocking my way was this humongous red book. 
and I had to get out of the car to move this book aside in order to continue on my way. So my analyst asked me, well, standard Jungian question, so what's your association to a red book? And this was before the red book was published. Maybe Jungian scholars knew he wrote a red book. I didn't. Well, my association to it was this holy book that I had written. And at first I really hesitated to share it uh, because she was, you know, my former supervisor, still involved in the network. I hadn't even got my degree yet. Uh, except that I did couch it in my best psychopathological language so that she'd know that I had the appropriate distance from it. So I described this delusional psychotic episode that I had and the auditory hallucination that I had and the uh, depression, depressive episode that I had and all the, you know, appropriate terminology. So after I shared that with her, she, her response was, well, that doesn't sound crazy to me. That sounds like something powerful was happening in your life. And then she invited me to bring that book into the session with her. Uh, so I dug it out and I brought it. And it, you know, it really uh, created a, a different context for this because now I began to see that really it was like a dream in a way. You know, one doesn't think that because one you know, uh, choke somebody in a dream that one sh uh, that that's what one would ever really do in life. So if one looked at it more archetypally, you know, what would I get out of this? But just as one basic kind of example, you know, it, within Jungian archetypes, Christ is an archetype of the ideal or perfect self. There's also a concept in uh, Jungian psychology of psychosis as compensatory. And this is uh, John Perry's work. Uh, and he actually did open up a center here in San Francisco where people who had experiences like my own could be allowed to go through these experiences without medication in an environment where they're supported to express and explore their experiences. But his idea of psychosis was that it's compensatory. So. I had lived a very, very a-spiritual life. And I think the spiritual side of me had overwhelmed me, just sort of grabbed control of me and said, pay attention, which in effect I have been doing for the rest of my life.